to welcome everyone here this afternoon. Um, uh, on behalf of the Department of Sociology, we're very honored to um, present Roy Turner to you as part of our speaker series. Uh, and um, right now, I'll hand the um, mic over to Dr. Peter Eglin, who will in introduce Dr. Turner. Roy Turner was born in 1928 in South London into a working class family. <coughs> Both his parents left school when they were 14. It appears he did or did not finish high school. In any case, huh? he worked five days a week as a lab assistant and took night courses in biology and chemistry thinking to become a scientist. Following the end of the Second World War in 1945, Conscription into the British Armed Services continued for a number of years so that Roy spent two years in the Royal Air Force. Demobbed and realizing that science was not for him, he studied English literature and history for a year at London Polytechnic. He thought he would probably go into English. In 1952, he found himself in Chicago, the age of 24, got a job, took the University of Chicago placement exam, passed and entered the English program. Discovering that English was not for him, he registered in a program in theory and research in regional and urban planning and got an MA. Looking up a friend in Berkeley, California, he inquired into becoming a student at Berkeley. He needed money, so got himself hired as an assistant by Kingsley Davis in the Department of Sociology. Davis, famous functionalist. Davis was doing demography at the time. Turner looked around the Berkeley department and stumbled onto Irving Goffman, realized that Goffman was something special, and became his doctoral student. He was awarded his PhD in 1968. His dissertation was called Talk and Troubles. Three years earlier, in 1965, he had been hired by the Anthropology and Sociology Department at the University of British Columbia, where he subsequently spent his entire full-term career becoming the director of the Ethnomethodology and Sociolinguistics Laboratory there. By the late 1960s then, he was not only a sociologist, but an ethnomethodologist and conversation analyst. He might tell you how he got from Goffman to Garfinkel and Sachs. In 1970, he published one of the seminal works in the field, Words, Utterances, and Activities. It has been re reprinted at least three times including in his own 1974 edited collection called Ethnomethodology Selected Readings, published by Penguin. In Jeff Coulter's 1990 collection, Ethnomethodological Sociology Classical Studies, in the Edward Elgar Schools of Thought and Sociology series. And in the four volume collection on Harold Garfinkel, edited by Michael Lynch and Wes Sherrick for the Sage Masters in Modern Social Thought series. He went on to publish a number of further exemplary studies in EMCA, including Utterance Positioning as an Interactional Resource in 1976, um, which was a critical reanalysis of a somewhat famous psychiatric interview that had been the subject of analysis by Pittenger, Pocket, and Danahy in 1960, and which led to this rather unusual book uh, in which the pages were divided uh, like this. The transcript of the interview running along the, along the top and the analysis running along the bottom. And a couple of papers with uh, a British colleague, Wes Sharrick, using calls to the police data in 1978. But it turned out that ethnomethodology and conversation analysis was not enough for Roy. And for at least the last 30 years, he has sought a different path which I hope he's going to enlighten us about in this talk. It involved not a few years teaching part-time and supervising or serving on the committees of graduate students at York University. He had retired from UBC in 1993 and for a number of years uh, worked uh, part-time at York. Since retiring a second time, he continues to think and write the most recent publication I'm aware of appearing just last year in the online journal Philosophy Now. Roy Turner is not just a CV for me, but the person responsible for dropping the ethno-methodological poison into my ear as a graduate student at the University of British Columbia. He became my dissertation supervisor. I was so toxified 
that I compiled the index for his edited collection at the methodology of selected readings. My reward, as I recall, was a free copy of the book. <laughs> uh, I hold it in my hand now, it seems, a very copy. In it, Roy wrote, uh, for Peter Eglin, who believes with me that natura in minimis maxima est. In one respect, I've lived by that maxim ever since. Please join me in welcoming Roy Turner, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know where you got all that stuff about the Royal Air Force and the uh, Polytechnic, uh, Peter. It's all online. Oh, is it? <laughs> okay. Um, as you point out, I taught at UBC from 1965 to 1993. When people ask me how long I taught at UBC, I say exactly the same number of years Mandela was in prison. Um, <laughs> I, no comment. Um, <laughs> now, what Peter didn't mention was uh, he asked me to give this talk quite short notice, uh, and I haven't had any sleep for the last 10 days. And also that it started out by being promised one kind of audience and then later was changed to a slightly different audience, and so I have had to divide my uh, uh, my, my presentation into bits, so to speak, to try to take account of, of, uh, of that. And uh, the result may be, I'm going to use an old English expression, I don't know if you know it, it may be a dog's breakfast. Okay. But uh, some dog's breakfasts are better than others, and uh, so I shall try to be optimistic. <coughs> I'm going to begin with the most difficult thing I'm going to say today. Don't ask me why I decided to begin with it, but I'm going to. Um, it's a position, a statement of a position that I would say has kind of supported me through various changes in orientation and work and so on. And namely that, I'm going to read it, before we're in a position to theorize or reflect upon language or tradition or common sense, we are already deeply embedded in them. For that reason, we are unable to retrieve or make fully explicit all that grounds our theorizing and reflection. I take it that Alan Blum is saying something similar in his book Theorizing when he says, I quote, to withdraw custom by forcing men to speak without it is impossible. Men who treat custom as such a thing under the illusion that they are providing for an independent assessment of custom are actually using the resources of custom to speak about it. So the emphasis there is on embeddedness, right? Uh, perhaps a slightly um, easier way to get into the notion is a little simplest by way of an uh, interesting statement by a man named Vincent de Combe, a French philosopher whom you probably haven't come across, but that's no reason why you should have. He's, de Combe says, it is reprehensible that philosophers should pretend to judge events as if they were seated in an auditorium rather than on stage like everyone else. Okay, there are two obvious implications to that, I would say. If the philosopher is seated in an auditorium, then presumably he sees all. On stage, he is engaged and involved like everybody else and sees only partially. The embeddedness again, right? But obviously for de Combe, there is no auditorium. We are, of course, all on stage in that sense. And it's perhaps a claim of, uh, of science or a claim attributed to science that it is seated in the auditorium, a claim particularly hard to make by social scientists, although that doesn't prevent them from making it. Okay, now if it seems to you that what I've said so far is obscure, you're right, okay? I shall try later to clear up some of that obscurity, but uh, it does authorize the arguments I make today, and that's why I uh, proposed it at the beginning. Part of uh, what I will have to say today will be somewhat autobiographical since Peter originally suggested I talk about you know, becoming an ethnomethodologist and the experience uh, and, and, and leaving and so on. So some of it will be autobiographical, other parts will be more reflective. Okay, now um, uh, one interest that has run through all the, the interests I've possessed since I became a sociologist dates back well to do I ever knew about sociology. It had to do 
with an interest in the influence of science on so many aspects of, of life. I say the idea of science rather than simply science because I'm not concerned with the bodies of knowledge developed by particularly the natural sciences, but with the respect, even reverence for science, that amongst other things has made it imperative for those who engage in the social sciences to claim their share of that respect and reverence. And the social scientists do have to fight some to get a share of that respect and reverence for science. Uh, and not everyone, of course, is willing to grant it. Um, I was present at a uh, commencement ceremony at U of T when a daughter of mine graduated there, and the keynote speaker was the novelist Saul Bellow, whom some of you may, may know. He was, uh, he's considered an American novelist, but actually he was born in Montreal. Anyway, uh, Saul Bellow made a brief reference, and I like the phrase to the wasteland of the social sciences. Okay. Now, you're a good man, Saul Bellow. <laughs> now, during uh, my graduate students' days, there was a lot of discussion about the scientific status of sociology. Is sociology a science? Can sociology be a science? And a lot of people played it safe, like Robert Merton, who you probably haven't heard of, and don't worry about that, um, who was one of the biggest names uh, in the discipline at the time. And his way of playing it safe was by saying, sociology is a young science. So as such, it did deserve the respect bestowed on science. But on the other hand, you couldn't yet ask much of it, fortunately. Um, and some years, many years ago, before I took up sociology, I was at the University of Chicago when there was a celebration of the division of social sciences at Chicago. It was a very prominent and uh, outstanding uh, group of departments in the social sciences. And at the celebration, they asked uh, one of their most prominent uh, members, one of the most prominent members of the division, an eco economist named Frank Knight, uh, a salty old American character who had a uh, way with words. And he said uh, that uh, in that talk, he had been thinking about the progress of knowledge in the social sciences, talking about thinking about progress in knowledge in general. And uh, in that spirit, he had gone to see the dean of the medical school and said, how long ago was it when medicine began to cure more people than it killed? The answer he said, it won't be long now. <laughs> And I took that as not too different from Merton's assessment of sociology, <laughs> right? Now, in the natural sciences, a belief in the scientific character of the discipline grounds the posture of the teacher, okay? The biochemist, speaking of biochemistry, is speaking as though he is the voice of his science. So that, in effect, biochemistry is speaking through the teacher. Some sociologists uh, seek to adopt this posture but they face a problem, which according to George Homans, another sociologist you probably haven't heard of, and don't worry about that either. Um, according to George Homans, natural scientists are mercifully free of a problem facing the, social, the sociologist. He says, the physicist runs no risk that the particles whose behavior describes will talk back. Well, he's right about that. Whereas, unfortunately for sociologists, the members of a society are ready, quote, to cut the sociologist off without a hearing, since their common sense understanding of the everyday world, uh, their, those understandings are in competition with sociology. And according to uh, Holmans, not only does society fail to recognize sociology's status as a science, it also fails to give it the customary respect for science. But even worse, society dabbles in a kind of pseudoscience because it throws up faulty generalizations of social behavior. There's sociologists trying to do it right, and there are these recalcitrant members of society doing it wrong. OK, now he's correct in saying that the members of the society who are addressed by sociology are possessed of common sense understandings of the world. But he fails to add that they're possessed also by the sociologist, right? Uh, not often uh, acknowledged. How could it be otherwise? How could the sociologist not possess the common sense understandings uh, of the society? 
But uh, Homan's version of common sense is impoverished. Uh, he treats it as a form of inadequate folk sociology. And this leads him to, I think, forget and ignore his own competence as a member of the society. And there's a nice way in which he displays this. I always I like this, to give this example in teaching. Homer quotes a number of what we would call proverbs and maxims. They're things that we all know, right? What does he have to say about them? He said, well, they're inept embodiments of empirical generalizations. They try to say something, to collect something, and to capture something about uh, social behavior, what it is, what it ought to be. And they get it wrong, or they, it, it's imprecise. And I quote now from Homans. Here are some of the, the things that he's talking about. Every man has his price. You scratch my back, and I'll scratch yours. You can't eat your cake and have it too and so forth. What makes the subject of everyday social behavior a chaos is that each of these maxims and proverbs, while telling an important part of the truth, never tells it all, and nobody tries to put them together. Well, what can you say? Well, he, Homer treats these proverbs and maxims as though they were sort of opinions waiting to be replaced by uh, knowledge. But in fact, as everyone else knows, um, their interactional ammunition that we all know how to use in our dealings with our, our fellows. A member who skillfully produces a proverb as a way, let's say, as a way of giving advice, couches it not in the form of a personal opinion. If I say to you, you're, you're telling me about something you have to deal with, too many cooks spoil the broth, I'm not responsible for this thought, so to speak. I'm, produce, I'm producing as as a uh, the, uh, social wisdom, and it manages uh, some, some features of daily interaction. It doesn't aim to uh, produce empirical generalizations about the social world. Now, Homan's thought seems to proceed along the following lines, if you can imagine this. Okay, we all say a stitch in time saves nine. Well, Homer doesn't actually say this, but I suspect he thinks some, that perhaps careful investigation will reveal it saves only 8.73, right, not 9. Um, and, uh, and we could correct these things and, and turn them into, into, into facts. And uh, God knows uh, what he would have done if, he had, if it had dawned on him that proverbial sayings uh, often exist in contradictory pairs. It's the squeaky wheel that gets the oil, but you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. Many hands make light work, but too many cooks spoil the broth. Can't people make up their minds, he might have said. But of course, interactionally, we need those. We, we, we need those. Uh, another uh, 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 confusion about verifiable knowledge and, and uh, the use of interactional stuff, uh, which I invented uh, along similar lines, is as follows. Let's say you're invited to dinner by friends, OK? Happens all the time, doesn't it? And when you ask, can I bring anything? Somebody says, well, it would be nice if you brought some fruit for dessert. OK. You give it serious thought. And you show up with tomatoes, green peas, and cucumbers. You won't find yourself praised for being botanically correct, but of course, they are all fruit. But you'll be treated as some kind of clown for pretending not to know the difference between fruit and vegetables which has no standing botanically, right? So uh, uh, Homer's presumably would, uh, would squirm a little about at that, but uh, I take it that uh, in our daily lives, we are familiar with the differences uh, between talking science and doing social interaction. Now, uh, Peter had suggested I should, I should um, talk something about the, the way I got into ethnic methodology and the, my educational background. And um, some of what he didn't mention in going through my uh, hidden past, studying regional and urban planning and so on, I'll just take a minute to say that uh, I was very lucky uh, to have as my teacher in that program on urban planning a, uh, a man named Edward Banfield who was completely opposed to planning. 
uh, and who uh, taught me a lot. Anyway, um, before I began my studies in sociology, I had acquired some interest in the literature of philosophy, which I've never studied formally, and I can no longer recollect how I stumbled across it. But in particular, something known as ordinary language philosophy. Right? There was a movement in philosophy which proposed that, that the artificial languages of philosophy, the mathematization of philosophy and so on, ignored uh, various aspects of ordinary language. And the, there were some prominent names in those days, perhaps not most of them not read too much anymore. A man named Gilbert Ryle wrote a book called The Concept of Mind. J. L. Austin, who was my favorite, wrote How to Do Things with Words and an essay of Plea for Excuses. Uh, Stanley Cavell, an American, wrote a book called Must We Mean What We Say, which was a kind of a Wittgensteinian work. And a well-known quote at that time from Gilbert Ryle may, made a, a, a point that many would have agreed with. He said, philosophers will pretend not to know the ordinary use of an expression, but they have no trouble when teaching children and foreigners how to use it. In other words, philosophers uh, 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 produced a kind of calculated ignorance of ordinary language as though that were uh, uh, essential uh, for doing philosophy. So ordinary language philosophy um, uh, had some appeal for me. And while I was at the uh, University of Chicago, I met uh, and became friendly with a man named B.C. Chappelle, who taught in the philosophy department. And through that acquaintance, I joined a private seminar he organized to read Wittgenstein's just published Philosophical Investigations. Some of you may have heard of Philosophical Investigations. It's a very hard book to read, but it's a very a uh, powerful book, perhaps the most important philosophical work of the 20th century. And um, that too uh, left some mark on me before I, I, I became a student of sociology, but it was one of the resources that I had in mind. 